you have your Bible, I hope you do turn to Romans chapter 2, which is where we find ourselves this morning, and I have a fun question to start off with that you can talk about at lunch if you don't already know the answer to this in your family. Here's the question. Are you more of a rule follower or a rule breaker? Now, kids, you can talk about this, too. I'm on, you, you should be thinking. When your parents tell you things to do, do you tend to fall right in and obey because you want to please them? You're a rule follower. Or do you think, how can I get around that? How can I do what I want to do? That would be a rule breaker. Are you more compliant or are you more rebel? Are you a goody-goody or a hoodlum? Okay, that's really what we're asking here. We have a continuum here. We have the rule keeper and the rebel, and I thought we should illustrate this for you. So the question is, are you more Richie Cunningham or are you more Fonzie? Okay. Now, some of you, I know, when I thought this, I know the first thing that my wife would say is there are people in our congregation who have no idea who Richie Cunningham and Fonzie are. If you don't know who Richie Cunningham and Arthur Fonzarelli are, please raise your hand, please. Just Okay, so we do have some people. So for you, I tried to be a little more contemporary and a little more hip to see. So are you more Team Jacob or Team, who's the other one? Edward. Are you more Team Jacob or Team Edward? Did that, did that help for some of you? Maybe. <laughs> How many of you have no idea who Team Edward? And, yeah, okay, that's what I thought. So, so maybe, maybe the question is, rather than just an either-or, and, and, and by the way, we're all somewhere on the spectrum. Nobody's all rule keeper. Nobody's all rebel. I mean, we're somewhere along the line there, right? You can plot your point on that line. But maybe the better question is, if you got sent to detention, which kid from the breakfast club would you be, okay? So would you be the criminal, the athlete, the basket case, the princess, or the brain? You can, you can talk about that over lunch, all right? Now you're wondering, well, what does that have to do with Romans chapter 2? Well, before we get to Romans 2, there is a well-known story in the Bible, a story you're probably all familiar with about what we usually refer to it as the parable of the prodigal son, and yet it would be more accurate to call it the parable of the two brothers because most of us spend our time talking about the rebel son. The rebel son is the one who went to his father and said, I want my half of the inheritance. I no longer want to be associated with you, with the family. I'm on my own. I'm going to call my own shots. He went out. He lived in what the Bible says was riotous living. So he basically indulged whatever passion he had. Once he had squandered all of his money, he found himself where you generally find yourself if you indulge in riotous living, he was in the pig pen. He was at the pigsty at the end of the day. And of course, he came to his senses thinking, why should I be eating pig slop when I could be back home in my father's house eating what, what they eat there? And he got up and he went back. And there's a great scene in the parable where the son is coming up the road. The father sees him. He runs to him. He embraces him. He says, my son who was lost is now found. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. I'm so excited. My son has come home. And most of us focus on that, and that's the great scene, and it's kind of the climax. We've gotten to the end of the story, but there is an epilogue to that story. It's the story not of the rebel son, but it's the story of the rule keeper son. The rule keeper son is the one who comes out to the father and says, this is not fair. There's a party for this reprobate who squandered half of the inheritance, by the way, and who now is back and we're killing fatted calves. You never killed a fatted calf for me, and I've been here doing whatever you ask, keeping the rules. It's just not fair. He's the rule keeper's son. And the father pleads with him and says, you've, had, you've always had whatever I have. You're, you're welcome here. You've lived in my presence. Why don't you come into the party and celebrate? And the parable ends there in kind of a, uh, an ending because... In the crowd, Jesus had a bunch of Pharisees who were the rule keepers, and he was presenting this parable so that they would see themselves as that rule-keeping son who's not happy that the rebels are coming home, who doesn't want to include them in the kingdom agenda. Now, if you think about where we are in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1 is the chapter about the prodigals. It's the chapter about the rebels. Paul calls them the Gentiles. That's the broad classification for them. But they are the people 
who have, have actively suppressed the knowledge of the truth about who God is and instead have said, we're going to call our own shots, we're going to live the way we want to live, and they have taken the grace of God and they've said, we're going to live for our own devices. And Romans 1 puts them in a downward swirl, a downward spiral that leaves them at the end of the chapter in the pigsty. The question is, are they going to wake up and realize where they are? Romans 1 is the prodigal son chapter. It's the rebel chapter. Romans 2 is the rule keeper chapter. It's the older brother chapter. Paul refers to these in the broad category of the Jews. They were God's rule keepers. God had given the law to them. They were proud of that fact. They were keeping the law. They were trying to obey what God had said. So Paul is turning his attention in Romans 2 to these rule keepers and he is saying to them that yes you've made some good choices yes you have better than average morality yes you have a heritage yes you you look at all of this but this is not what makes you into a good person you you're you may be better than most but you're not perfect and you need to see that you need salvation just as much as the rebels do just as much as the prodigals do the rule keepers need Jesus as well so Paul is writing in Romans 2 he knows that when, when you get to the end of Romans 1, the, the Jews who have been reading him talking about the rebels and saying, listen, rebels, here's what's happened. You've denied God. God's given you over to this. He's given you over to this. It, it's going to go It's gonna go poorly for you. And all of the Jews are going, you tell them, Paul. These guys need to hear this. I mean, it's about time somebody tells these Gentiles what dirty swine they are. You go. That's where they are at the end of chapter 1. And then he turns to them and says, now hang on, you guys, you rule keepers. You may think you're in better shape than the rebels, the immoral, the Gentiles, but you're really not. The truth is, you are hypocrites because you say one thing and do something else, and you're in trouble too. John Majors looked at the first half of Paul's rebuke to the hypocrites last week when we were in the first part of Romans 2, and we're going to pick up the second half of that chapter this morning and we're going to see that Paul is continuing to make this case that in spite of the fact that the Jews are God's chosen people and they are in spite of the fact that God has given them his law and he's not done that for any other nation on earth in spite of the fact that they've been circumcised and have the mark of the covenant on them in spite of the fact that they have benefits and advantages because they are Jews in spite of all of that they need a savior as much as the rebel Gentiles do. That's the statement he's making in Romans chapter 2. And by the way, that message made them really mad. Because no self-righteous person likes to have somebody come along and say, you're not as good as you think you are. Their response to that is typically, oh yeah? Well, we're going we're gonna to read the second half of Romans chapter 2 this morning and dive into how Paul makes this case, makes this argument. Before we read it together, um, pray with me, all right? Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we confess that your word is perfect, it is holy, it's infallible, it's inspired, it is authoritative, it's right, it's true, it's beautiful, and Father, we love your word because it is in your word that we come to know and love you. And that's why we love it. So we pray that this morning you would open our eyes and hearts and our minds, whether we are rebels or rule keepers or somewhere in between, you would help us understand our need for Jesus. Help us to find our hope and our joy in you. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you follow along. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Uh, it, the words will be up on the screen. You follow along as I read it out loud. Paul writes, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you're instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, 
do you not teach yourselves? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Amen. May God bless this reading of his word. Now, as John Majors pointed out, the first half of Romans chapter 2 is about Paul saying to his Jewish readers, there's an issue of hypocrisy among you. You say one thing, you do something else. He also says God is going to be righteous and impartial in how he judges men. God is not going to let you off the hook for your hypocrisy simply because you're Jews. That would not be righteous or impartial for God. If he's going to judge the Gentiles for their sin of immorality, he will judge you for your sin of hypocrisy. That is right and fair. What he's telling his Jewish friends is that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are immoral people who make no bones about it, and there are moral people, immoral people who try to convince themselves that they're really not as bad as they think they are. You get it? Everybody's immoral. There are the immoral who celebrate it. You can read about them in the newspapers. You can watch them on TV. I mean, they have parades. They have parties. They celebrate their immorality. And then there are immoral people who try to put on the guise of morality and try to present to one another, I'm, re I'm really a good person. I really am. You know, I do. I try hard. I, I work. And Paul is anticipating that the cleaned up Jews are going to raise this objection that they really are moral people. And Paul knows this objection because what did Paul used to be? <laughs> one of them, right? I mean, Paul used to go around representing himself as a law-keeping Jew who had he knew he wasn't perfect but he also knew he was better than most and he thought that counted for something. It wasn't until he met Jesus that he realized that doesn't count for anything. So Paul can hear their objection as he makes his argument. He knows they're going to say now wait Paul have you forgotten God gave us the law the revelation of himself. God gave us circumcision the covenant sign and seal of his promise God chose us to be his special people. Out of all of the nations of the earth, we have God's favor and blessing. And we got proof of this, Paul. We have the law, we have the covenant, we have the mark of the covenant in circumcision. So that's got to count for something. Gentiles don't have that. That's got to be worth something. Are you saying, Paul, that Jews, God's chosen people, are no better off than Gentiles? How can you say that when we have these blessings from God and he has distinguished us from the Gentiles? How can you say that he's going to judge us just like the Gentiles? And that's where Paul responds. In, in verses 17 through 24, he says, let's talk about the law and its benefit. And then in verses 25 to 29, he says, let's talk about circumcision and its benefit. And he insists that in fact, the fact that they have God's moral law and they seek to keep it, and the fact that they have kept the ceremonial law in circumcision, that does not guarantee them immunity from God's judgment. That's what they're thinking. They're thinking, as long as I try to keep the law, and as long as I'm circumcised, I am immune from judgment. That's on, on judgment day when God says, okay, here's the charge against you. I'm going to hold up. I tried to keep the law, and I was circumcised. That gets me in, right? They think that's the golden ticket. 
and Paul is saying, I didn't go, I didn't go wash for you. Look back at 17 to 24 where Paul is saying that there's a blessing that comes from having and knowing and seeking to obey God's law, but the blessing does not exempt you from final judgment. That's the point. Is Israel blessed to have the law of God? Are you better off in life if you know God's law, if you know his precepts, if you know what is the right thing to do? Are you better off than those who don't know? Yes, you have blessing. Will that get you into heaven, the fact that you have that and know those things? No. So there is benefit to being a Jew, Paul says, but it's not saving benefit. It's not going to stand up on judgment day. Yes, you have these blessings of God, but unless you respond to them rightly, you will actually find that you're in worse shape than the Gentiles who didn't have the blessings in the first place. So he begins by listing all of the reasons why they ought to feel comf- or why they do feel comfortable that God is on their side. He says in verse 17 that they say, "Wait, wait. We have the name Jew." That's our we you know what that name means? That name means Yahweh uh, prays to Jehovah. God gives us a name that that identifies us as his, as as the praise of of him. We are his praise. We've got that as our name. Their name is means their very identity is found in it's rooted in their relationship with God. So they say, look, God has given us an identity that he's not given to the other nations, and he's tied our name to the fact that we we praise him. Second, they say, we rely on the law. This is again verse 17. When they say we rely on the law, what they mean is our rest, our dependence is in the fact that God's given us his law. He's given us his command on how to live. He's not done that for other nations. So we have a superior moral code. We have a superior morality than all those people around us. Now, by the way, we should say here, that's true. The morality that the nation of Israel had is the right morality. What God has given them in his law is instructions on the right way to live. We live in an age of moral relativism where some people will say, well, that's your thought, that's your opinion. You think it ought to be this way, I think it ought to be that way. The Jews are saying, no, God gave us the right way to live, and they're right, he did. So they, they're saying, we have a superior understanding of morality because we are God's children. Third, they say, we boast in God. In other words, we have the right view of who God is. Part of the boast of the Jews was the fact that they they were monotheists living in a world of polytheism. They believed in the one true God, and they were proud of the fact that our God is the God who is the maker of heaven and earth. He's the one true God. He's high above all the gods. No other God is like our God. This is what the Jews said. So we have the one true God. The Greeks have their gods. The, Jew, uh, the, the Romans have their gods. There's all this polytheism all around the ancient world, they said. But we boast in the fact that our God is the only God, the one true God, the one who is high above. They said on the theology exam, we'll get an A+. Plus because our theology is right. Not only is our identity right, not only is our moral code right, but we got the right theology. This ought to count for something, right? And fourth, they say they know God's will and they approve of what is excellent. They have the right way to live. They have the right, we'd call it orthopraxy. You know, orthodoxy is having the right belief, the right praise, orthodoxy, right praise. Orthopraxy is the right way to live, the right actions, your praxis, your living. So they say, we, we know the will of God. If you have questions about what is God's will, you can come to us because we know God, we can tell you what his will is. In fact, if you've seen Fiddler on the Roof, you know how this works, right? In Fiddler on the Roof, whenever there's a question about something, where do they go? To the rabbi. Rabbi, is there a blessing for the czar, right? Yes, may God bless and keep the czar far, far away from us, right? Do you remember that? Rabbi, is there a blessing for the sewing machine? Rabbi, is it okay to dance? They go to the rabbi and they ask the questions. Why? Because the rabbi is the man of God. He, he knows the will of God. So this is the Jews boasting in the fact that we have the answers. The other nations don't have the advantage. They don't know what God's will is. And fifth, they say, because we have the law and we know God's will and we're equipped 
by God, we can provide clarity. We can, we, we can teach others. God set us apart to be a guide to people who are spiritually blind, to be a light to those who are in spiritual darkness, to be an instructor of the morally and spiritually foolish person, to be a teacher to the spiritual children. Why can we do this? Because we have the law in the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Here's their case. They're saying, Paul, look, I, we're not like the Gentiles. Our identity is different. Our morality is different. Our theology is different. Our orthopraxy is different. Even, even this idea of, of being able to provide clarity. We're a light to the world. God made us to be a light to the world. By the way, God did call them to be a light to the world. They had kind of left that assignment. They were not out proselytizing. They were out condemning the Gentiles, not trying to bring Gentiles into the fold. Uh, there, there's some ancient writings that talked about condemnation for the Gentiles. There was no love for them. So they, they make their case. They say, Paul, how can you say that we need a Savior just like the Gentiles do when we've got all of this on our side? Our identity is rooted in God, as God's people. Our morality is shaped by his will. Our theology is right. Our orthopraxy is right. And he's made us the leaders of the blind. How can you say God's not pleased with us in some way? And that's where Paul takes them in verse 21. He says, okay, yes, you do have all of these blessings from God. You know him, you know his word, you know his ways. You ought to be able to teach others. How come there's still this hypocrisy, this sin in your life? How come you know all these things, but you don't do them? You preach against stealing, right? Which commandment's that? Anybody know? Eight. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. You preach against stealing. Do you steal? Well, this is the point. You remember the, the woman caught in adultery when they all started putting down their rocks because they had to search their hearts? Do you steal? Anybody in here never stolen? I mean, time or never stolen stuff from the store when you were a kid? Never stolen money from your parents' wallet? Never stolen anything from anybody? Never found something and said, hmm, Nobody around, I'll just keep this. What about adultery? You teach against adultery, and yet, do you commit adultery? In the Jewish world, if a Jewish man, if his wife did something he didn't like, he could give her a certificate of divorce. You know what that involved? Him saying, I give you a certificate of divorce. That was all it took wake up some morning and she's grouchy and grumpy, he goes, you know what, I'm done, you're out. In fact, the, the, the formal ceremony was you'd walk around her three times saying, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, it's a done deal. Yeah, that's how they would do it in the ancient world. So, so how did they commit adultery in those days? You would just divorce one wife and you're out on the hunt the ne that afternoon for the next one. That, that was an adulterous heart. And it wasn't just adultery. There were extramarital affairs going on in those days, just like there are in these days. And it was happening among the religious people. There were Sanhedrin members, undoubtedly, who had moral lapses. And then verse 22, the one about robbing temples. You abhor idols, but you rob temples. This a little tricky, and, and interpreters kind of go, we're not exactly sure what he was referencing. When did the Jews rob temples? And by the way, interestingly enough, the Jews at this point in their history had gotten to a point where they had really, they were done with the nation as idolatry, with, with idolatry. They were not like the Jews had been all through their history. All through the history of the Jewish people, from Abraham on down, they keep lapsing into idolatry. Abram was an idolater, right? And then his children were idolaters, and they hid little household gods in the, in the tents when they moved off to Egypt, and then they brought some out of them. Just idolatry over and over again. The Ashtra pole kept coming up, and they kept worshiping the gods of Baal. All of these things throughout the history of Israel. Well, now, first century Jews have really gotten it right. They say, we're not going to fall into idolatry anymore. We're, we're not going anywhere near it. So what's this robbing temples? Well, there, there are a number of different thoughts about that, but my, my thought is this is a reference to the fact that in temple worship, in Jewish temple worship, before you could get in to worship anybody, who'd you have to pass by? All those money changers, all those people who are gouging you for your sacrificial animals. You know, we got a special on doves today. They're just marked up four times the normal cost. 
as you go in to get it. They were gouging you. Basically, you had to go past the idolatrous, money-loving money changers before you could get to the temple. And the temple, the, the Sanhedrin approved of the whole deal. They were in on it. They got a cut. So I think the robbing temples is really robbing God of the glory that he deserved and turning the whole thing into a commercial enterprise. But that's just one possible option for what he means here. The point is clear, though. He says you ought to be teachers, but here's where you are. You can't even live up to what you teach. You can't live up to your own code. And in verse 23, he says you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. You brag about the fact that you've got the law, but then your life doesn't match up. And then, and this is scathing, verse 24. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That's, that ought to, it, when you hear a statement like that about somebody, that ought to cause you to really sober up. The people who should have been a light spiritually to the blind were actually the people who were driving the blind further away from God. They should have been an attraction. Instead, they were repelling people. Kent Hughes says this. He says, The very privileges which should have produced saints had instead produced arrogant, loveless egotists. Now, I want to stop here for a little application. Is this principle at work in our day? Among Christians, would it be fair to say that the name of Jesus has been blasphemed among people in our day because of ungodly, immoral, unloving, uncharitable, proud, arrogant, rude, critical, harsh actions and words from people who say we love Jesus. You think? Think there are any people who have been driven farther away from Jesus because of the unloving, unkind, uncharitable actions or words of people who say Jesus is our king. We see it all the time. Wouldn't it be accurate to say that we all know well-known people who have declared their love for God but then have lived their lives in a way that, that brings shame on their testimony? They, they've, their lust for power or their greed or their sexual sin has brought them, has brought dishonor on the faith that they claim to hold to. We've seen it happen with religious leaders on national scale. We've seen it happen with local pastors who have brought dishonor and disrepute to the gospel by choices they've made and how they've lived. But the question's not really about them. The question's about us. And this is a hard one. You ready? Is there anything in the way you live, in public or at home, anything that might cause an unbelieving friend who knows about that to think, if that's what it means to follow Jesus, I'm out. Anything about your attitude, about your words? Anything about your anger? Anything about your arrogance? Anything about how you live that would cause somebody to look at your life and say, wait, if, if that's what it means to be a lover of God, a lover of Jesus, I don't want anything to do with that. Listen to what Ligon Duncan says. He's the chancellor at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson. Listen to what he says about how critical it is for us to live lives that don't bring dishonor to Christ, but instead adorn the gospel. He says this, when professing Christian believers claim to be followers of Christ and they live in contradiction of that profession, they become the single greatest hindrance to the gospel. The greatest hindrance to the spread of the gospel in the world this day is not that the Bible has not been translated in every ang ang uh, language. It's not that we don't have missionaries among every people group. The greatest single hindrance to the cause of the gospel today is nominal Christianity, hypocrisy, false believers, people who claim to be believers but who do not give any evidence whatsoever of the reality of that claim. The single biggest obstacle to evangelism is hypocrisy. The single greatest impediment to the spread of the gospel today is the nominal Christian. <clears throat> I think he's right. I think the thing that is keeping people away from Christ is people who name the name of Christ, whose lives look no different, whose love looks no different, whose kindness looks no different, 
whose joy looks no different, whose peace looks no different. We could go on, right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who's sufficient for these things? You are the aroma of Christ. Wherever you go, you give off a fragrance. The question is, how do you smell? Is it a good fragrance or is it an odor? Is it a fragrance that causes people to go, I, 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 that smells good. Like, you know, when you walk into the movie theater, what's the first thing you smell? The popcorn, and you go, I want some popcorn, right? But you walk into some places and you go, ooh, ew, get me out of here. What's the aroma that you give off? Your life is giving off either a sweet-smelling aroma because of the grace of God pouring out of you, or your life is giving off an odor that sends people in the opposite direction. In Titus chapter 2, Paul says it this way. He's talking about bond servants and their masters. He says, bond servants should be submissive to their own masters in everything. They ought to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith. Look here. So that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. What does the word adorn mean? Do you know? When you adorn something, what do you do? You take something that looks good and you make it look more beautiful. When you adorn something, you add beauty to what is already there. It, it becomes more attractive when you adorn it. It means that your life should adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. People should see your life and you sh they should say, the doctrine of God looks better because I see how you live. Your aroma, your fragrance, your adornment of the gospel is either a testimony that draws people or a testimony that repels people. So, do you think that's the case? Are people being drawn to Christ because of what they see in you? Wasn't the case for the Jews. People, nobody was being drawn to the God of Israel because they looked at the Jews and said, we want to be like them. If that's your God, just, just by the way you live, we, we want to know more about your God. Paul said the opposite is happening. They're seeing how you live, and they're saying, that's a worthless God. He doesn't do any good. They're blaspheming God. Their God doesn't have any power. Doesn't change anything in their life. Doesn't make anything better. Bunch of hypocrites. Bunch of do as I say, not as I do types. Could that be said of you? And would the charge stick? I mean, hypocrite is the favorite word of the non-Christian when it comes to the Christian, right? It's a great word to throw out, whether it's true about you or not. And we all face the reality that some hypocrites, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? Some public, prominent hypocrites make us all look bad. But you still have a witness of your own. Now, I can hear somebody saying, now, hang on, wait. Nobody's perfect, right? I mean, you expect perfection? You expect we're never going to mess up? No, that's not what God is saying here. But you can, in the power of the Spirit, evidence in your life the fruit of the Spirit. You can, in the power of the Spirit, live a life that is not perfect, but that is above reproach. That's the standard we're looking for. It's a life that says that, the, that God is at work in me and that he's changing me. Not, God is not calling us to adorn the gospel and to, to give off a fragrant aroma and then saying, uh, you're on your own. He gives us his spirit so that these things can be true about us and through us. Now, I want you to think for just a minute about the stressful situations you walk into and you will walk into this week. Uh, some of them may be on the job. Some of them may be at home. Moms and dads can get stressed by their little ones. Employers can get stressed, or employees can get stressed by their employers. I will travel tomorrow. Tomorrow morning I leave on a flight. Before I get on the flight, I have to go through TSA. Okay? I don't know how many of you think, man, the thing I love about flying is going through TSA. I just, I love seeing those people. I love getting a chance to greet them. And they're always so, they're, they're happy to see me. You know, they're always, a, they smile. It's just, it's a joyful experience to go through that particle machine. I just love that thing, right? Nobody thinks that. 
We all tense up when we go through TSA. We all get a little frustrated. We keep our heads down. We don't want them to call on us. Nobody's looking up at the TSA agents and saying, have a good day. Yeah, we're not doing that, right? And if you get the random search, how many of you go, this is an opportunity for me to adorn the gospel right here? <laughs> I have an opportunity to give a sweet fragrance of Christ, right? And then you get to your gate, and they say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, uh, we got a little problem with the flight, a uh, mechanical difficulty. Uh, we're not exactly sure what the delay is, but uh, stay in the, the lounge, and we'll keep you posted on what's going on. How many of you in that moment go, here's an opportunity for me to give off a sweet aroma of who Jesus is? <laughs> Airports are not a place where that comes naturally. So here's what you do. Before you get to the airport, you stop and you pray. And you say, God, I'm headed into a stressful situation. Things could go bad where I'm headed. And if they do, Lord, I want to be a person who demonstrates that you are at work in me and that you are in control of all things and that I love you and I trust you. And you, you prepare yourself for that so that when it happens, you go, I was ready for this, rather than griping and grumbling and getting snippy with people. What do you need to prepare yourself spiritually for this week? What do you need to pray for and ask God to, for grace to overflow in your life so that you can be a blessing to others? What are the stressful situations? And, and here's the other side of it. You will blow it. We've been there, right? We've all blown it in front of others, family members. We've said things. We've lashed out. Maybe it's been at the airport. Maybe it's been in the workplace. Maybe it's been with our kids. When you blow it, you set off a stink bomb wherever you are. The aroma of Christ is just one big stink bomb right there. But there's a way to bring air freshener into that situation. You know what it is? It's humility, confession, and repentance. Humility, confession, and repentance is the air freshener that gets the stink out of the room after you have stinked it up. So when your attitude, when your actions blow it, when you are the hypocrite, when you give off a poor aroma and you go back to people and say, I, I just need to ask you, I, I should not have done that. Will you please forgive me? Uh, that is not consistent with the kind of person I want to be. And I've asked God to forgive me. I hope you will too. That takes a lot of the odor away from that situation, and that can be a pleasing air freshener in here. I hope everybody would agree that the last thing we'd ever want anybody to say about us is that the name of God is blasphemed, blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Can you imagine God giving you that judgment? The name of God is being blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Lord, take me home before that's true of me on a consistent basis. I don't want to be that guy. So Paul's argument to the Jews is, yes, you have all this benefit, all this advantage. It's true. It's real. But you're failing to obey. You're failing to live up. And as a result, you're more of a hindrance to the work of God than a blessing to God. And then they got one more card. They said, wait, 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 wait. We got circumcision, sign of the covenant. That's got to count for something. The other nations don't circumcise. I mean, who would, right? Unless God tells you to, that's not something you're going to say. I think that'd be a good idea. Let's do that. So they say, what about this? Jews believed that this was the covenant sign and it was their guarantee into heaven. In fact, some of the rabbis wrote this. Circumcised men do not descend into Gehenna. Or circumcision will deliver Israel from Gehenna. Those are some of the rabbinic writings. Long as you got circumcision, whatever else happens, that's your ticket. You can count on that. So this is the last, this is the Jews ace in the hole. They're pulling it out and going, okay, I know, maybe we're hypocrites, maybe we haven't lived up the way we go. We got circumcision. Trump that, Paul. Now keep in mind, God was the one who had commanded circumcision back in Genesis chapter 17. This was, in fact, the, the, the uh, desire of God. It was his way of saying, we're going to physically demonstrate to you and to others the fact that I have set you apart. You have set yourself apart as my people. This is a sign and seal of the covenant. It was given by God. But as John Stott says, it was never intended to be a magical ceremony or a charm. 
It did not provide the Jews with permanent insurance that covered them against the wrath of God. It was no substitute for obedience. In fact, let's do a little circumcision, little circumcision math, okay? They believed this. They believed circumcision equals God's blessing. They thought they were the same thing. If you got circumcision, you got God's blessing. They're the same. Paul, in verse 25 of chapter 2, says that's the wrong equation. Here's the right equation. equation. Circumcision plus obedience equals God's blessing. It's not circumcision that equals God's blessing. It's circumcision plus obedience. In fact, he says in verse 25, circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. We can say the same thing about religious practices in our day. Coming to church on Sunday morning is of value. This is, a, this is the most important hour of the week for any of us, to be here, to be in, among God's people, to be singing God's praises, to be sitting under the preaching of God's word. There's no more important thing you can do in the week to get you ready for what you're facing than to be here in this place where you are this morning. It's the most important hour of the week. It's of no value to you if you come as a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word. You get no credit. God is not up taking attendance. Go, well, they've got a perfect attendance record. That counts for something. It doesn't count for something unless your heart is open to God, his spirit is working in you and transforming you. It's not the ritual that has any power. It is the work of God in this place in the middle of this. God's not impressed by your attendance. He's not impressed by your baptism. He's not impressed that you take communion. <coughs> Those are things God has given you as means of grace so that you can become more like him, but they don't have power in themselves. The power is in your understanding and obedience to the call of God. God takes note when he sees you growing in grace. He, when he sees you dying to self, when he sees you loving and serving others, that's when God says, oh, there's something going on there. Not, oh, they showed up at church, must be something going on there. Oh, they got baptized. Okay, something going. No, he's watching and seeing how does your orthopraxy change? How does your life change? How is the spirit at work in you? Now listen clearly. There is importance to all of these things. I'm not minimizing baptism or communion or church attendance or any of the religious activities we do. But the benefit doesn't just come from the activity. The benefit comes from having the right heart about the activity. That's what Paul is saying about circumcision for the Jews. It's not the cutting of skin that has benefit. It's what it signifies and how it shapes your life. That's where the benefit comes from. In fact, here's the formula he lays out in verse 26. He says, if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Here's the formula there. Uncircumcised plus keeping the law equals circumcision. Okay? How does that work? Well, something about keeping the law changes it. And then in verse 27, he says, one who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. Or we could say it this way, circumcised minus keep the law equals condemnation. So if you're uncircumcised and you keep the law, that's circumcision. If you're circumcised and you don't keep the law, that's condemnation. What Paul's doing here is he's redefining Jewish identity. He's saying your identity is not in the cutting off of foreskin. The identity you have is in the righteous obedience. In fact, he refers to it not as the circumcision of the flesh, but the circumcision of what? The heart. What makes a Jew is a Jew is not that he has the moral code and he's been circumcised. What makes a Jew a Jew is that that he is he, he shows himself to be one of God's chosen people when he has a heart that is poised to say yes to God when God calls him to something, a heart of obedience. That's what's make, what makes you a true son of God, a true Jew, a true son of Abraham. And Paul is reminding them, this is not new teaching, this circumcision of the heart. This is in Deuteronomy 10. Deuteronomy 10, Paul says, circumcise therefore the forcing of your heart and no longer be stubborn. Circumcised heart's been there from the beginning. And then in Deuteronomy 30, he says, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul that you may live. The circumcised heart has been around from the beginning. And the point is that physical circumcision was supposed to be a picture of something 
inward in the same way that physical baptism in our day is a picture of something inward. Now, hear me, I don't believe that baptism is the replacement for circumcision. I think they're two different ceremonies for two different times for two different purposes. But they do have this in common. Physical circumcision is a picture of something that's supposed to be going on inward in the same way that baptism is a picture of something that has already happened inside of a person. So Paul says in Romans 2, he says, No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. A Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His, and this last phrase, his praise is from men, is not from men, but from God. The, the, his praise is, what, what does the name Jew mean? Praise of Jehovah. So when he's coming down here, he says, a true Jew, his praise, it's a play on words, his praise is from God, not from men. What defines you as a true Jew? It's not something outward and visible. It's something inward and visible. It's not something that happens in the flesh. It's something that happens in your heart. It's not something done by the law. It's something done by the spirit. And it's not something done for the approval of men. It's something done for the approval of of God. And of course the same thing is true for people who are followers of Jesus today. Your love for God is demonstrated not outwardly but inwardly first and then it flows out of that. Back in the late 1970s there was a guy who sang Christian music. Some of you old people will know the name Don Francisco. Don Francisco is famous for a song he did called He's Alive. Dolly Parton recorded, he's alive. That's how he sang. He had, a, he had kind of a vibrato in the voice. So that was his big song. But he had another, he had another song that was out at the time that was less, less of a, a hit, but it makes a, a, a point about Romans chapter 2. It was called the Steeple Song, and the lyrics were, I don't care how many buses you own or the size of your sanctuary. doesn't matter how steep your steeple is if it's sitting on a cemetery. I don't care if you pave the parking lot and put pads upon your pews. What good is a picture-perfect stage if you're missing all the cues? I don't care if your pastor is super-powered and your program's always new. What you need is love and truth, and men are going to come to you. It doesn't matter if you know the Bible, if it's all just in your head. The thing I need to ask you is, have you done the things I've said? Do you love your wife? For her and for your children, are you laying down your life? What about the others? Are you living as a servant to your sisters and your brothers? Do you make the poor man beg you for a bone? Do the widow and the orphan cry alone? I don't care if you pray for miracles. don't care if you speak with tongues. I don't care if you said you love me in every song you've sung. It doesn't matter if, you sacri if your sacrifice of praise is loud enough to raise the dead. The thing I need to ask you is have you done the things I said? That's what it gets down to, isn't it? Obedience. It gets down to is there evidence of transformation going on in your life? We started this morning by asking whether you were a Romans 1 rebel or a Romans 2 rule keeper. You have more in common with the prodigal son or more in common with the older brother. But you know what the Romans 1 rebel and the Romans 2 rule keeper both have in common? They both need someone to save them from themselves. The rebel needs someone to save him from his immorality and his disregard for God. The rule keeper needs someone to save him from his spiritual pride, his self-righteousness, his self-centeredness, and his self-deception. In fact, put the, put the breakfast club kids up there again. All five of these kids need Jesus, right? Doesn't matter whether you're the criminal, the athlete, the basket case, the princess, or the brain. Doesn't matter. And we had all of these in high school. You were, you were in one of these groups, right? I mean, all of us back when social circles were all defined like that, we were all there. And, and we'd look at it and we'd say, now the princess and the brain, they're the good kids. They don't have any detention. Well, they're, they're in detention. These two are, right? But, but for the most part, they're the good kids. They're the rule keepers. The criminal, the basket case, they're the bad kids. They all need Jesus. I don't know who you relate to here, but the point is, if you're putting any stock in your moral goodness, anything that makes you feel better than all the bad people in the world, Paul has a word for you, and the word is you're in trouble. John Majors talked last week about the fact that uh, he had some spiritual pride when he was in in high school, you remember, because he didn't gamble, he'd never gambled, and he kind of felt good about it. You remember him saying that? 
Well, I have to confess to you this morning, I've been to casinos twice in my life, okay? Uh, I, th the first time I went, I was in college, and I went to Las Vegas with some friends, and I gambled in Las Vegas. I played blackjack, and I played some other things, and I kept, I kept $10 in my wallet so that I would have some, something to eat after I'd lost everything that I had there. And I lost everything that I had, including the $10 that I had in my pocket. <laughs> And I was hungry the rest of the trip. And it was a great lesson. It was a great lesson because I, I walked away from there going, this is probably not a good place for me. And that stuck until I lived near Reno. <laughs> and I thought, I'm just going to, Marion was gone for the weekend. I'm just going to drive over to Reno for a day. I'm going to take $50, and I'm just going to count it as recreation, just spending money, recreation money. Yeah, I'll go over. If I lose it, fine. I had a fun day playing cards, right? And that's what I did. Well, I went over. And after two hours of playing cards, my $50 was 68 bucks. <laughs> and I said to myself, I am cashing in and going home a winner today. And I promise you, I got to the window, and I said, what are you doing? You're on a hot streak. <laughs> and I went back and promptly lost the whole shoot match, drove home empty-handed that day. That's the last time I've been to a casino because it was like, this is not a good place for you to be. That you would, you would ruin yourself in this casino. Now, I have never bought a lottery ticket in my life because I know that if I bought a lottery ticket, I would win and it would be in the papers, Christian radio host and pastor <laughs> wins the lottery. And I'd be saying, it's the only time I ever, people go, sure, right. Although, did you see the guy from Texas who just won the big jackpot here, the $77 million or something? He won it out in, in Stuttgart or at a convenience store or something. $77 million. I saw in the paper that he's going to buy a new building for their church. And I read that, and I said, Lord? No, I didn't. I, I had the thought, okay? So I... I'm not where John Majors is when it comes to gambling, but I'm pretty close. But here, I, I've got, I've got, I'm going to put my resume up there, okay? And this will sound weird to some of you, but I'm just going to let you know. I, I uh, have never been drunk in my life. Never. I, probably because I grew up with a dad who was an alcoholic, and there was nothing attractive or appealing about that, so I just never went there. When I was five years old, I had sips of beer from my dad's beer cans as we sat out on the front porch. As f that's the last time I had beer, was when I was five years old. Well, I take that back. Last summer, when my boys were home, my son said, here, Dad, just try. He poured a little ounce of beer in it. Like, just try it. And I sipped it, and I went, Ugh, give me Diet Coke. That, the, the, I, and he goes, Diet Coke. Ugh. So we, you know, to each his own. That's fine. I, I have never had I don't, I don't know what gin tastes like. I don't know what whiskey tastes like. I've never had rum. I've never had a margarita or a pina colada. Now, I'm not saying these things are bad. I'm just saying I'm better than you because of these things. <laughs> I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never puffed a cigarette. I'd, I'd, I've never had that experience. I've never chewed on a chaw of tobacco. I've never put a pinch between my cheek and my gum. I have never done any drugs that weren't prescribed. I do love nitrous oxide when I go to the dentist. I'm sometimes hoping for a cavity just so I can have that wonderful buzz from the nitrous oxide. I've been in church almost every Sunday I can think of for the last 40 past plus years. I've been baptized. I helped to lead the youth ministry. I, I have led worship. I have preached. I've been ordained. Have I experienced benefits in my life because of all of the stuff I just listed? I think I have. I think never being drunk, there's a benefit to that in somebody's life. Are those benefits giving me a spiritual advantage over anybody here? No. Can I go to God with my resume and say, look, look, God, I don't need a Savior. Look, I didn't buy a lottery ticket. I've never been drunk. That gets me in, right? No. Romans 2 rule keepers have the same uncircumcised hearts that Romans 1 rebels have. My appearance may look better, but God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And anyone who could see my heart would know that I may be clean on the outside, but I'm dirty on the inside. And in fact, if you look at your own heart, guess what? We'll all find the same thing. 
I mean, you all look like nice, respectable people, but you know your own heart. <laughs> and if we knew your heart, we wouldn't want to come over to your house for lunch, would we? And you wouldn't want to have us over. So how do you get your heart circumcised? You admit that you need a Savior. You admit that your life is messier than it may look on the outside. You admit that it's not your goodness, not your, I didn't do this or I did do that, that's going to be your ticket into heaven. You instead believe that God has provided the way to be reconciled, and that way is through the death and resurrection of his son. Jesus lived the life you couldn't live, died the death that you deserved, so that you can be reconciled to God and you surrender control of your life to him. And you do it simply by calling out to God and saying, I need you, I believe in you, I trust in what you've done to me, and I surrender my life to you. I'd love to talk to any of you more about that. I, I think the question for all of us is, is there anybody here who is a Romans 2 rule keeper? A Romans 2 rule keeper. You've done all the religious thing, but there's not the reality of the work of God coming through in your life. Anybody here whose religion is a show? If you are here this morning, you have surrendered your heart and your life to Christ. You, you're, you know that God is at work within you. You know the transforming work of his spirit in your life. Then God invites you to a table where he provides grace. Now, there's nothing in the bread or in the juice that, is, that has, it's not grace-infused crackers not grace-infused grape juice. What it is is God coming and saying that when you come and you think about my death and my resurrection, when you meditate on these things, it is in that meditation that you become aware and alert of your need, my provision, and in that there is grace. So the bread and the juice and the practice of communion is to draw our attention back to what is at the center of our faith, which is the gospel. And that's what I want you to meditate on as you prepare to come this morning. If you're a visitor, we practice open communion. You're welcome to come down the outer aisles, receive the elements, take them back to your seats. We'll drink them together. I'm looking around. I don't see a visitor. Anybody here? Who's, you don't have to hold up your hand. I'm just looking. I think all of you know the drill. So we'll come down the outer aisles. We'll go back to our seats and take them together. And uh, you prepare your heart as I prepare the table. <laughs>
as Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples. Uh, we don't know who were the rule keepers there and who were the rebels, but we know that all of them needed a savior. Jesus took bread at the Passover meal, and after he had prayed a blessing, he broke it, he passed it, he said, this bread is my body broken for you, and as often as you receive this, remember me. And so, Lord, this morning, that's what we're doing. We're remembering you. We're remembering what you did for us, and we're remembering just how much we need your grace in our lives, just how much we need your forgiveness and your transformation in us. So strengthen us as we come in obedience to your word and as we surrender again our lives to you and pledge ourselves afresh to you. We receive this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. In the same way, when the meal was concluded, Jesus took the cup, and after he'd prayed a prayer of blessing, he passed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, the covenant of my blood, shed for the remission of your sins. As often as you drink this, remember me. And so again, Lord Jesus, we do remember our sins, which were scarlet, are now white as snow. And it's not because we did something to cleanse them. It's because you did something, because you are the perfect, spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, including our own. And so now we rejoice in that, and we remember that forgiveness is ours as we feast on Christ in our hearts, and we receive this now with grateful hearts. Amen. Let's stand, and I want us to sing the last verse of the... Um, Behold him there, the risen lamb, our perfect spotless righteousness. We'll sing that again, and then I'll dismiss us with a benediction. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die this purchase by his blood my life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my Savior and my God with Christ my Savior and my God now with open hands and open hearts receive this blessing from Christ Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace and abide with him. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.